Romans chapter 12. We're just going to read verses 1 and 2. And I kind of want to get you into this message this morning to bring you into uh, where we're going to be for a little bit. We're doing a Renew series. And uh, renewal is a big subject in the Word of God. If we're not careful, we allow the things that kind of become cliches or power phrases or things that we hear about often, uh, we can allow the familiar to lose uh, its majesty and the excitement that God has when He says, hey, you're going to need to renew your mind from time to time. You're going to have to remember things as opposed to constantly being taught new things. And, uh, and I think remembering who God is and what He has done is a big deal, but I also think it's important to remember how those things affect or impact us. And so renewing your mind uh, can cover a gambit of things. And uh, this morning we're just going to talk about specifically this idea of getting in the game. And uh, that starts here in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Here's what the Bible says. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God... So I think it's important to make sure we understand while we're reading, when we're reading it, Paul is begging them to do something. That's not something Paul does a lot. Paul tends to tell them, I have the authority of Jesus Christ in my corner. I'm telling you what you need to know. Listen to it. Do you have anybody in your life that tells you things that way? You don't always receive that real well, do you? Unless they have authority over you. So if you go home and your husband or your wife goes, sit down. <laughs> Just see me Tuesday and Thursday. That's when I offer counseling. And I'm off on Tuesdays. So that window is really small. If a police officer tells you, sit down. I don't know about you, but I sit. Like, you know, I, I, I haven't been pulled over a lot in my lifetime. Not as often as someone I'm married to. But when I am pulled over... <laughs> That one is just a truth, y'all. Second laugh for the truth. She drives a car like she stole it. Third laugh. They're little feet, but they're full of lead. Fourth laugh. We well, just keep going. So, so when a person of authority tells me to do something, I'm a very compliant person, and I obey what they tell me to do. But that depends upon their authority. And so Paul often does that. And I just think it's important to note that in this particular case, as he is writing, he is beseeching them. He's begging them to listen. What I'm saying to you is so important. And it's the foundation for what it means for us to renew our minds about every subject that we're going to talk about. So he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now a couple of things that I just think are important there. Living sacrifice. It's like, that, it's like that phrase when someone will say, well, I'm willing to die for Jesus. You're literally saying, I'm willing to go to heaven for Jesus. Well, good for you. I'm glad you're willing to go to paradise for, for Jesus. Living for him is more difficult. Staying in this world with its pain and its difficulty and its challenges. Like, why do hot wings cause heartburn? Why do they have to, like, do that, right? I don't... We'll move on. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, which literally means set apart. That you're not doing this living sacrifice thing to anything else but God. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So a part of renewing your mind is why does it say reasonable service? Well, you were born in sin. You lived in sin until you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those of you in the room today that are heaven bound, you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and by no work of your own, but by simply believing in your heart that Jesus is exactly who the Bible says he is and he did exactly what the gospel said he did, you are now saved. And as a continuing sinner, you are now guaranteed of heaven because of Jesus Christ. Billions and billions and billions of years of God showing you His mercy and grace by allowing you to be in heaven, right? And what did it cost you? Not a thing. And what did it cost Jesus Christ? Separation from the Father when He became sin on the cross, which was one of the worst, most horrendous ways to die, right? 
So it cost him a lot. It cost you nothing. It makes sense to me that it's reasonable service that I would get in my life. That I would say, hey, you know what? You've given me eternity. If you give me 50 years here or 60 or 70 or 80, I'll, it's reasonable. I'll just, I'll live for you. And the blessing is, is that living for him doesn't eliminate all fun and all joy and all of that stuff. Sure, there are some things that in order for you to follow God's ways, you'll have to not follow your own ways. But can I tell you, your own ways would just ruin you anyway. So it again is just reasonable service that once you receive him as your savior, you would live the rest of your life for him. Well, but that's going to be hard, not as hard as the cross was. Well, it's going to be long. I mean, if I have to live in this for this many years, not as long as eternity. So like all of our arguments, all of the human side of us, it's like, but I want this or I want that. Here's why I don't want to live the way God wants me to live. All of those things we come up with really fall short in the comparison of eternity, right? And so it's just reasonable service. So we're going to talk about a few different things in this idea of renewing your mind. We're going to talk about marriage and relationships next. Uh, so if you're in a marriage, or if you're in a relationship, that way I just covered everyone in the room, right? Um, we would really love for you to attend and be here for the next couple of weeks and learn some things that God has said, some very practical things that God has said about relationships. But today, we're going to start off with this idea of getting in the game. We're going to talk about football. And I like football, but basketball was my, was my sport. Um, but I want to bring up something that's been on my heart a long time, ever since I was in high school. Cheerleaders matter. <laughs> I finally got that out. Uh, cheerleaders matter. Very few of you are with me on this. I can feel the energy being sucked out of the room as I say that. So that means few of you were cheerleaders. Our youth pastor's wife, our family pastor, Emily, was a cheerleader for wrestling. Did she cheer for wrestling? Did they have cheerleaders for wrestling? They wear the same outfits the guys wear for wrestling? I was curious. I didn't know. So they're better dressed than the guys. Find me a sport where they're better dressed. But look, cheerleaders matter in the game. So when I played basketball, they had these chants. And the first one they did every game. Jump ball, get it, get it. Jump ball. Woo! <laughs> like literally that was it. And they like did the pom-poms and then they had like a, we were the Eagles and we were blue and white. Like 80% of America at the time were the Eagles and they were blue and white. And so it was really funny to see the cheerleaders do their, their battles. They had another one about rebound. R-E-R-E-B, R-E-B-O-U-N-D, rebound. I don't know why a lot of cheers are spelling. <laughs> the cheerleaders need to prove the point that they... I don't know. Um, can, I, can I read to you from a little bit later on in Romans 12? We're just going to read verses 9 and 10. And I'm going to read them in the NLT because I love the way it says this. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Do you ever see that? You'll have some person who's a Christian and they'll do something and it's a good thing and people will applaud it. And for a while there was this like mandate that you had to say, oh, don't applaud me, it's just Jesus living through me. And, and then I heard a guy talk on this once and he said, you know, the word of God is full of places where it says we should honor one another. Is it wrong to applaud someone else? You're not worshiping them. Is it, wrong to, is it wrong to celebrate somebody else's good thing they did? I mean, that's not worship, is it? I think, honestly, guys, we should probably applaud our wives a little bit more often in the house, shouldn't we? She stayed with you, so, I mean, that deserves something. So I had this idea, be a cheer leader. This is it. <laughs> Took a lot of skill to throw that one together, y'all. I wasn't a cheerleader growing up. I don't know how to spell. Be a cheerleader. So let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just say it this way. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, that we are to gather together more and more as we see the day approaching, as we see the Lord's return. Can I tell you, every day since that verse has been written, every single day, it has been true. It will be more true tomorrow than it was today. Because every day you're getting closer. 
And why would God say that we need to be more encouraging as we get closer to his return? The world must be getting more discouraging. And I'm telling you, people in this world, they need a cheerleader. They need someone behind them saying they're good enough. Saying that they're loved. Saying that they can do the thing that they're dreaming that they can do. Being told about the things they do right more than what they're told about being wrong. Now, I know I'm going to jump on some toes real quick because today's not the marriage thing, but we're going to go there. Ladies. So your man was born into a world that wants to tell him he's not allowed to be a man. True? Like he's not supposed to swing an axe. He might cut himself. It's that, it's that TV show, I'm telling you, you're not allowed to shoot a BB gun because you will shoot your eye out. A boy is supposed to shoot his eye out. He has a cool scar. He gets to wear a patch over his eye, basically halfway to piratey. When you let him swing that axe and he chaps half of his leg off, with leg, I mean he's pirate. That's full bore pirate. And you ladies know that you would have been more attractive to your guy if when you met him he was a pirate. He'd be like, what in the world? You know, Captain John B. Lewis. You know, the, the thing is, is that this world isn't very friendly to men being men because way too many men have abused it. Way too many men have used strength or power in some way that it's hurt other people. And our answer usually is to make rules to try to curb behavior. Rules don't tend to curb behavior, but that's what we do, right? And so you're born into that world. You're kind of raised that way. You might be raised without a dad, or you're raised with a dad that wasn't told he was allowed to be a man, or you're raised by a dad who doesn't really pour into you very much. In our world now, if you didn't start playing whatever sport it was when you were three years old and play all summer, all winter long, you're not good enough to play that sport. And so we have to change things around. Let's not let there be winners and losers. Men need to lose so they'll step up and win. So if you just give them a trophy no matter what, so I can phone it in. And that, that fifth grader phoning it in will turn into a couch potato when he's older. And his wife's going to be like, I just don't understand why I can't get him to do anything. I nag him all day long. I tell him he's horrible, he's a bum, he's lazy, he's lucky I'm still with him. If he doesn't get up, I'm going to divorce him. And he doesn't move with all this energy and excitement to help me. I don't get it. Look, men are built with an innate need for admiration. And I think the world is growing in the fact that everyone is kind of needing admiration and validation. But I can promise you that when men think of love, they're thinking of respect. And if he isn't respected, he doesn't feel loved. And that applies everywhere. We might tell you not to bring the kids to one of the marriage places or sermons so that I can explain how it applies everywhere. But can we just flip the script for a second? Can you imagine, as a man you grow up, ladies, you're going to have to try to imagine being a man for a second, so that's trouble for you, so just go with it. As a man, you grow up and, and you're kind of struggling with the am I good enough to be a man thing. You go out there and you get a job and you get some life going the right direction and you end up marrying a girl that you love. And you trust her more than anyone else in the world. So whatever she says really matters to you. And you get a new job. It's the one you've always wanted. It's a step down from where you were, but it's going to take you where you want to go. And you go to your wife and you share that with her and she says to you, I'm so proud of you. This has always been your dream. I know you're going to be amazing at this. I can't wait to hear what you do and celebrate as you climb that ladder. I know this has always been in your heart. Babe, go for it. And then plants one on him. A candy bar of some kind is what I mean. Like the one he likes you plant that on him. Can you imagine how he would respond to that? Compared to, well, how are we going to make ends meet? I can't believe you quit your job without talking to me. Guys, if you're going to quit your job, talk to your wife first. Like, ladies, I'll get on them during the message series as well. Okay, don't worry. I'm an equal arrow shooting preacher. But, but I, just want to, I just want to give you a simple example that if, if there's this person that you trust more than anyone and their words are kind and uplifting, you will feel encouraged and empowered. And if their words are negative and complaining, you would feel discouraged and lacking power. Well, my husband wouldn't change no matter what. Give it a try. 
Treat him like the man you want him to be and see if he won't start becoming that way. Are you a boss or are you an employee? Because if you're a boss, you have a responsibility to lead in your organization, cheer and encouragement. Every single person that meets you ought to feel better when you leave them. Look, you can say the things that have to be said in a positive way. I've done it my whole life. I know you can do that. And you can say positive things in a negative way. Right? So if you're the boss, be a cheerleader. If you're an employee, be a cheerleader. The bosses and the people above you who you think have the greatest responsibilities and jobs in the world, they might be carrying stuff you don't have to carry. Maybe they'd be nicer to you if you were nicer to them. Look, look, we need some cheerleaders in this world. We need some people who are willing to say, I'm going to choose to live my life as an encourager. Not because what's around me is constantly encouraging me, but because what's around me constantly needs encouragement. So those are going to the gas station up the road that I see every Sunday morning. I stop in there and grab a Diet Pepsi on my way to church. Body by Diet Pepsi right here. And it fuels me through my morning. And when I get in there, she's always doing the numbers. She's like, she's got cash on this back counter and she's figuring it out. Every time I come in there, I'm just like, give me calculator. And she laughs. I come in, I'm like, gas station account. And she laughs. I come in and I'm like, you're carrying a gun, aren't you? Because anybody could grab that cash. And she laughs. This morning she was done. And I'm like, you're running early or I'm running late. And she laughs. Like, it isn't even funny. <laughs> really, I thought, all I have to do is be like, hey. And she would probably laugh. And she just, she needs somebody to be nice to her. And so inevitably from time to time, as it happened this morning, there'll be somebody in line in front of me. And they're just never nice to her. I don't get that. Like they're, they're either quiet and they don't say anything at all. Or in this particular case, the person was saying, hey, that wasn't that price. It was this price. She's like, oh, I know. I just looked this morning. It's actually this price. All the sign is wrong. I don't think so. And like she's trying to be nice to him and he just wasn't real nice to her. And I stepped up and I was like, that's what you get for getting the numbers done early, isn't it? And she laughed. I mean, she likes it. She's like, she gave me my pop for free. Oh, so I like her too. She encouraged me. I encouraged her. It was win-win. Win, win, win. Look, everyone in this world needs a cheerleader in their life. Every person you meet. You, if you know Christ as your Savior, I'm going way too long on the first point because I only get to halftime show. If you know Christ as your Savior, can you not be happy about it? I know there's all these other things that you're not happy about. I do. I know that. I really, really get that. But if you are going to go to heaven forever, can't you be happy about that? And if you're happy about that, can you smile about that? And if you're smiling, can you be nice to somebody, not because they deserve it, not because your life is easier than theirs? Can you just be nice to them because you're happy about the fact that Jesus died for you? We need our minds renewed of that. Or we begin to believe we have a right to be rude. Can I tell you, you don't? If you know Christ is your Savior, all your rights to be rude have been taken away. That one thing that has happened for you ought to empower the rest of your life with happiness. Trust me, I know there's all the reasons we're not happy. I, I really probably need joy and not happiness. When you embrace that God is for you, you can stop fearing what's going to happen to you. So this is why it's so important that we do this in church, that church be an encouraging place. Because when you embrace that God is for you, you can stop fearing what's going to happen to you. Now, now on one hand, I could throw this at you. Right? I could just I could apply it that, hey, I know you guys have fears and I know you have struggles and, and you look forward and you're like, well, what if I get cancer? Or what if I get hit in my car accident? Or you know, what if I lose my job? Or what if my kid doesn't turn out right? Or, or what if, what if, what if? And I realize that. And, and I can apply this to you and say, when you embrace that God is for you, which if you know him as your Savior, you ought to know he's for you. When you embrace that, you don't have to worry about the future. You don't have to worry about the future. But instead of you applying it to you, can you apply this to everyone that you walk around in this world? 
Do they have any reason not to be fearing what is going to happen to them? So World War III is starting. Did you hear? <laughs> World War III is starting in Iran. It's, it's going gonna, gonna, to happen. Or somewhere else, right? Someone is developing a magnetic bomb that will blow everything electronic up in the world. I, cell phones cause cancer, and you're probably going to get it from it. Food makes you fat. <laughs> Diet food makes you fatter. <laughs> I don't know how it does that, but somehow the problem is we're eating diet food if we would just go back. You know, the, the thing is, is you can take any little thing. If war happens, it's going to be horrible. We wouldn't make light of that. If you have cancer, it's horrible. I don't make light of that. But I can promise you that you can get a disease that you don't want and God will still be good. And you'll still be okay. I can promise you. Does, do, do your neighbors know that? Do your friends know that? Do your relatives know that? Do the people driving by on Jersey Ridge, do they know that? I mean, they have got to know that. They need him. And if you're not a cheerleader, if you're grumpy everywhere in your life, please don't invite people to come to Legacy. I don't want them to know that you, are, you come here. I mean, it is okay to be, it is okay to not be okay. But if you're grumpy and mean to everyone that you meet, please don't tell them you come here. If you do, let them know the preacher's working on you every Sunday. He just told me last Sunday I wasn't allowed to tell you that I go there because he said rude is not allowed. Look, we, we can be the best or the worst testimony of Jesus Christ. And something as simple as being a cheerleader matters. Referees matter. Do we have that clip ready? Mm -hmm. Don't look at it. You ready? Yeah, yeah, throw it up there. Yeah. I'm not moving. This is too many steps. Quick snap. Breeze. This is hurts, doesn't it? If you're a Saints fan, I'm sorry. Just, you can shut your eyes if you're a Saints fan. And the two officials talk to each other. Oh, yeah. You can tackle a guy before he catches the ball and not look at the ball at all. That's. That's why it's so hard to catch a pass in the NFL. That's the coach. He's like, go, yay, good job, ref. Nice call. That's the bad lip reading version of the second game. Did you think it was a penalty? Yeah, I really do. I know it's took his hat off to him. You see that? Good job, ref. High contact on the reset. Clearly contact before the ball. Clearly contact before the ball. If you're a referee, you do not want that announcement. Clearly a ref is losing his job over this. Wow, can we pin in on him? Oh, it's the one that can't see. He was over there. Yeah, I mean, Sean Payton, he just simply cannot believe it. Can't believe how good the referee is. All right, that's probably enough of the clip. Um, how many of you have ever refereed in your life? You just, we got a good amount. We have a good amount. How many of you have ever been ripped off by a referee? He cost your team or you the game, right? That was me. So in college, I got referees some basketball, and I had done well at the lower level, so they keep promoting you up. And I was in a championship game with a buddy of mine uh, who we played college ball together. And we were refing a really huge regional game that was going to go on to stay the high school atmosphere in Missouri. The stands were just full. Of, of people and, and like it was the two of us it was before you did three referees and we just we were so psyched up to go out there and do a good job and my buddies it was Tim Adams TA and I were like hey let's call it tight because the crowd needs you to call it tight or they just start saying you missed the call you missed the call you missed the call right so we did really good with that in the first half and the best players on both teams had three facts you get five in high school if you don't know basketball so T.A. and I were talking at halftime, we're like, hey, we can't foul out the best players. We're going to have to call it a little loose with both coaches and teams, they'll have our heads. So we did that, and in the third quarter, both of them got their fourth foul. The game was within like two points the entire time. And when you referee a game like that, you are praying that somebody blows somebody else away. Because then you do not have to worry about that one call that might cost someone a game. The reason that call against the Saints is one of the worst calls ever is because the score was 20 to 20. Had the score been 55 to 7, like Ohio State playing Michigan type of the score, you know, Ohio State, um, 
you knew it was coming out. Still hurting from the season. Still hurting. So, so it's the last 30 seconds of the game. And, and the home team's best player brings the ball up the floor. And he does what you should never, ever do if you're a basketball player. He dribbles over the half court line. If you don't know basketball, once you cross it, you can't go back the other way or you lose the ball. He's in the corner, so this is out of bounds. Behind him is the half court line. He steps here and picks up the ball. Now he can't dribble. He can't pass it behind him. And the other players come up next to him. And the other team's best player, belly to belly, hits him. And I saw it. And that's a foul. It's a pushing foul. And he would be out of the game. He had four fouls. I decided not to call it. I played through that kind of stuff at college ball level. Come on, just play through it. But it knocked him off balance and he did this. And I saw that too. But I saw it like this. And I looked up and an opposing team's like dad was right there. And he went, you saw that? You suck it, you suck it! Just blow your whistle! Another foul occurred. I did see it. I didn't call it because the reason he stepped over is because he got fouled. Well, then call the foul. I don't want to call the foul because I don't want to... You know, nothing happened. Three seconds later, the dude got fouled for real and he went to the free throw line, which is what would have happened. That's the longest 30 seconds of my life. <laughs> I'm telling you, it lasted 97 minutes. There were so many timeouts and fouls, and that dad in the stands followed me wherever I went, yelling across the court at me, You saw that! I saw it! Oh, being a referee is not fun. It is not easy. Have you made some bad calls in your life? I'm so glad that God is my referee when it comes to eternity. He's perfect. He's never going to make a bad call. So you can't get to heaven as a sinner and get into heaven. Right? You can't get into heaven as a sinner and get into heaven. You can't be a sinner. God is perfectly holy. Imagine holiness as light. So, so could there be darkness around the sun? Anywhere around the sun, can it be dark? Right? Your brain's like, no way. I mean, the sun is just way too bright. So, so no matter where you're at around the sun, the light is pushing all the darkness away from itself. The sun can't choose to allow there to be a shadow right in front of it just because the sun wants to choose that, right? No, the sun is this burning, gaseous star that light is flowing off of it, and it doesn't matter what darkness you throw at it, light is there. You can't even get within like 100,000 miles of the sun. So imagine God's holiness more like that. He is so holy, and that holiness is so coming out of him constantly that sin just can't be in his presence. It's not a God's mean and angry that he won't allow it. He can't allow it. So the only way that you can be saved is to have the kind of holiness Jesus has. And that's why he died for you. So that when you receive him as your Savior, you have his holiness. It's why it's offensive to God if you think your works can get you to heaven. Come on. Well, I can build a like, darkness big enough that you could give it to the sun. No, you can't. That's ridiculous. I don't care what you build. The sun is going to cast light all around itself. You can't work hard enough to be holy enough to be in his presence. You have to receive the holiness of Jesus. That's what we talk about getting saved. So, in John chapter 8, this scene unfolds where a woman has been caught in the act of adultery. So before we, like, some of you know the story, but before I tell it, um, can you stop and think about what has to happen for a group of religious people to catch a woman in the act of adultery so that they can bring that woman before Jesus so she can be judged? I mean, it's a sting operation, right? It's a trap. They even knew it was going on and just decided to jump in instead of loving them and helping them and all of that stuff. The guy isn't brought. Why isn't the guy brought? Right? 
So this woman is brought before Jesus and there's this crowd, old and young Jews, with stones in their hands. And they say to Jesus, hey, the law says we should stone her. And the Bible's language is really specific. That Jesus goes down to the ground and draws on the ground and he pretends not to hear them. So let that fry in your noodle. The God that cannot lie pretends not to hear them. But he didn't say he didn't hear them. Right? And so they're like, hey, don't know if you heard us. Moses' law says we should stone her. Can we stone her? Can we throw these rocks at her until she's dead? They just they don't even care about her. They just want to know what Jesus will say. So they can trap him in his words. So his Bible says he stands back up. And I just wonder if it was like a back off me type of a move. You know, like as if he was drawn, they were leaning in to see what. And then he stands up and they're like, ah! <laughs> I don't know. I like to imagine those horrible religious leaders that way. And he says, whoever among you has not sinned, go ahead and start throwing stones. And he just stoops back down and draws. I think he delivered a kind of deadpan. You know? Whoever among you. I just don't think it was like that. I think it was matter of fact. You know what? Whichever one of you is the guy that hasn't sinned at all, go ahead and throw a stone. You'd be the first one. And then he goes down. The Bible says from the oldest to the youngest, they walk away. We picture them dropping their stones, don't we? As they're walking away. From the eldest, they led the, the example there. So Jesus could have picked up all those stones and thrown them at her, right? It would not have been an unholy act. But God's love triumphs over and over and over again. And so he gets up and he looks at her. He's like, where are the people that condemned you that brought you here? She's like, there ain't no one here, Lord. You know? He's like, I just wonder. She was like, well, they're all gone. Please don't throw the rocks at me. Or she's just intimidated to be in his presence. Did she know he was the Messiah? He said, if they haven't condemned you, neither do I condemn you. He didn't say if, as if like their righteousness mattered. But he just said, neither do I condemn you. The one that can't decided not to condemn. That's our referee. The only one qualified to throw a stone did it. The only one qualified to throw that stone did it. How dare we? How dare we throw stones? Like, you think that woman went and found the guy and drug him out to the elders and said, he committed adultery with me, let's stone him. What do you think happened in her life when she could have been killed and Jesus instead rescued her? You think she went around the rest of her life saying, man, I just mm, can't wait to judge somebody, can't wait to tell them their faults. I just think she probably went around remembering that day she could have died, and she didn't. That day that the one that could have judged her didn't. And if he didn't judge her, why would it be right for the followers of Jesus Christ to walk around with stones in their hands, refereeing everyone in this world? I have made some bad calls. So when I run into people that have made bad calls, I tend to show mercy and love and grace. I speak the truth because that's a part of loving people, right? But I don't speak the truth condemning them. Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Because if you keep living your life this way, it's going to hurt you. That's the spirit. Not because if you do it one more time, I break your neck. That's not who God is. So I don't think his followers should be that way. All right, I want to do the halftime show. And then, and then I'm going to wrap things up. So you're going to give me just a little bit longer? Because it's time for the halftime show. When you're at a Super Bowl and a preacher, the game, is laying things on you thick, like this preacher's laying things on you thick, you sometimes just need a quick break, don't you? And before I give you the last thought, we're going to sing another song. So the Father's House is a brand new song. If you did not know that, it's been out recently. We sang it earlier. You now know that song, church. You heard it once. So we're going to invite you to sing it with us. Stand to your feet. Shake off the dust. You are the halftime show. Let's worship God and then we'll get back into His Word.
The other thing is that tailgating matters. And, and what I mean by that is that in Revelation 3.20, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if any man will open up, I will come in and I will sup with him and him with me. Now, it's being said as these letters are written to the churches of Revelation and these churches are vastly different. Some of them have horrible, sinful doctrines in them. Some of them are practically perfect and just have a few little things that maybe they need to do differently. And then Jesus reveals a part of who he is to all of them. And in this last one, to the Laodicean church, he says, Behold, I stand at the door, I knock. If anyone will open up that door, I'll come in and I will sup with them. I like to think of Jesus supping with me as kind of like, what's up? You know? So, so, Jesus likes to get together with you and so, what's going on with you? How are things? How are you doing? Where have you been? How's life working out for you? Hey, you know all those ways that you're trying to live life on your own? How's that working out? Hey, you know all those things that you've been adopting that are my principles? How are those working out? Like, Jesus wants this relationship with you. Not just because He knocks on the door of our hearts so that we might come to know Him as our Savior. But He constantly keeps knocking so that we'd have a relationship with Him as our Savior. Tailgating for me as a kid was always fun. It was never at an actual like arena or anything. It was my Uncle Kenny and his buddies. Uh, they would park trucks in a circle around each other and let the tailgates down and cook food. We sat around and we ate. It was like kind of camping. Uh, hick style because we weren't at a camping place. We were like in a Walmart parking lot. Um, but the question I really wanted to ask is this. Where do you need to let him in? So that he can say, so, hey, with this area of your life, what's going on here? Am I in it? Am I not allowed? Where do you need to let him in? I wrote down some ideas, and uh, if you'd stand to your feet and bow your heads and close your eyes, I'd like to read them to you. And if God, if God wants you to be more of a cheerleader, I hope that you'll respond to Him today.